Hello friends, Dr. David Katz, another COVID reality check. This one about darkness and burgeoning light. The, the darkness at this phase of the pandemic is fairly obvious. We're hearing every day about unprecedented case counts, unprecedented hospital census, and an ever-rising mortality toll. This is due to a, a number of factors, uh, turn of the seasons, more exposure indoors, and uh, alas, pandemic fatigue, and the failure to differentiate among risk tiers in the population. Young, healthy people can be exposed to this virus, and the likelihood of adverse consequences is very, very low. Uh, but in much of the country now, it appears that regardless of personal risk, people are allowing themselves to be exposed to the virus, uh, whether inadvertently because of the behaviors of others uh, or because they've decided they've had enough. But we're seeing uh, the, the very unfortunate consequences of that with the demands on hospitals uh, and the rising fatality toll. And uh, we're also getting some encouraging news about the imminent availability of vaccines, and that information is readily available to you. Uh, I don't have much to say except that uh, effective vaccines will be very welcome. What I want to contribute to the uh, information barrage right now, and what I hope may clarify it somewhat, is a recent report by the CDC that, that may have gone overlooked just because we have so much daily information about COVID, indicating that total case counts in the United States are at least eight times higher than the official tally suggests. This was a report based on essentially models that took advantage of a variety of data sources, factored them all in, and then projected that uh, even with all the testing we're doing now, uh, we're still missing most of the cases of infection that are occurring. This comes as no particular surprise to me, uh, and maybe not to you if, if you've seen my prior videos, because I, I talked about my own very crude modeling of this same issue two and a half months ago. And at that time, I reached the conclusion using two independent models, again, very simple ones, that we were underestimating the rate of infection by an order of magnitude. So I basically said uh, it's 10 times higher than we're reporting. CDC says eight times higher. We're in the same ballpark. I, I still think it's 10, but eight or 10 doesn't much matter. So right now, the count of total cases in the U.S. officially stands at something over 14 million. Uh, but multiply that by eight or ten and you're well over a hundred million. Now th this is really important news uh, because what it means is that the 280,000 deaths that have occurred in this country, many of them of COVID, some of them perhaps with COVID and, and ascribed to the virus but maybe due to, to other factors, and it's going to be a while before we sort all that out, uh, are not out of a denominator of 14 million people, which would put the infection fatality rate at about 2% or 20 times higher than the flu, but are out of a, de a denominator as much as 10 times higher than that, which would make the infection fatality rate 0.2% or twice that of the flu. That, that's a really big and important difference for all of us because Obviously, the fatalities attributed to COVID are, in many instances, tragic, uh, and um, most of us have experienced them uh, personally at this point uh, in, our, in our personal networks. And as ever, my condolences to anyone who is directly affected by all of this. But in terms of the threat to the population at large, uh, the, the notion that two out of every hundred people could be killed by this virus is a very, very different prospect than two out of a thousand. And the 0.2% means it's two out of a thousand. Uh, and it, it means that most people infected with this, the overwhelming majority, recover. There's another important implication of this eight times as many or 10 times as many have been in infected. I, I 
readily confess that uh, my hopeful projection that the pandemic would end on or about October 1st was wrong. But it's interesting to speculate on why it was wrong. Uh, what, what was the, the naivete, if you will, uh, that informed that project, projection and where did things go awry? So it, that projection was based on the experience in New York City, in the Northeast, in my home state of Connecticut, where we had a surge in viral transmission last spring. Uh, we saw it peak and crest and then dissipate. And in the aftermath of that, it appears that we've gone a long way toward herd immunity. Uh, and again, herd immunity, there, there should not be heresy. Um, it, it simply means enough people are immune. It can be achieved after infection. It can be achieved with vaccination. Either way you get there, the objective is the same. Enough people are immune that the virus stops circulating. That's what herd immunity means. So it looked like certain parts of the country were there. And then there was fairly widespread transmission of the virus throughout the rest of the country and essentially taking the timeline from New York City, Connecticut, and applying it to the rest of the country looked like we may be through this by or about October 1. But the eight or 10 times higher case count puts us at, let's say, 140 million have been exposed uh, to the virus or infected by it already. Well, that of course means that the remaining 190 million had not. And so a large portion of the total U.S. population up until recently had managed to steer clear of the virus. Now, in a sense, that's a good thing, but only if they continue to steer clear of the virus until either A, viral transmission had burned out and there was no longer any risk of exposure, or B, we had the uh, advent of uh, vaccine availability, so it was safe to come back out to the world. What seems to have happened by virtue of people uh, being burned out and exhausted by the pandemic, by virtue of conflicting news about the pandemic, conflicting opinions about the pandemic, intolerance of, of some of the fairly blunt policy responses to the pandemic, one-size-fits-all mandates in, in many states that, that people resent and are inclined to rebel against, and lack of federal leadership, and on and on it goes. For, for all of these reasons, what, what seems to have happened is that that 190 million all went back out into the world pretty much at once, that enough is enough. And, and of course, it, it isn't every last one of the 190 million. There are still people being careful, thank goodness. Uh, let's hope they continue to be. But a large portion of that 190 million, and so an even bigger population than was exposed last spring, is now being exposed all around the country all at once, including people in all the various risk tiers, and that's the problem. If young, healthy people around the country said, we now realize that this virus is not a big threat to us, we're going to be relatively cavalier when we're interacting with one another, but we also have learned that this virus is a very serious threat to our older loved ones, we're going to be extremely careful when we gather with them. And if people who have obesity or any major cardiometabolic condition or are elderly remained extremely vigilant about themselves, we might see high case counts without the high casualty counts. Alas, none of that has happened. So some major portion of the 190 million went out into the world regardless of, of their personal risk and are seemingly not taking the necessary precautions for themselves and are also not deriving the benefit of others looking out for them. So when I projected that we might be done on or by October 1, I, I was hoping that the parts of the country that had not been hard hit, that major portion of the population that had not yet been exposed, would be learning the lessons of the pandemic, the, the hard-won lessons of the pandemic, from those parts of the country that had been hard hit. Alas, there's a famous expression, those, those who don't uh, learn from the follies of history are destined to repeat them. That's what we're doing. This, in effect, is a second wave now of the pandemic, but there's nothing about the virus that's responsible for the wave. Uh, the virus was 
perfectly capable and willing to infect, ex infect and expose people during the summer. There's nothing really about the turn of the seasons that made the virus behave any differently. It is possible that congregating indoors uh, does allow for um, more transmission of the virus in higher doses resulting in more infections. But mostly we are making the waves. We, we basically stopped being careful and exposed ourselves en masse and, and here we are. But again, th there is light at the end of the tunnel. So first, uh, the fact that there are eight to ten times more cases than we're reporting means that a very, very large portion of the total population has been exposed. And as that official case count goes up day by day, think about the total number of cases actually going up day by day, but ten times higher than that. Well, you know, we're, we're getting to the point then when 200 million Americans have already been exposed to and, and potentially infected by this virus. So we are moving through the whole population. And when you get through the whole population, everybody's had this and is through this, that is herd immunity. However much of that happens between now and the availability of vaccines means that many fewer people remaining vulnerable. The other important thing, again, is that if the total case count is 10 times higher than it appears to be, the infection fatality rate, tragic though it is, is 10 times lower. It's not 20 times greater than influenza. It's two times greater than influenza. Still quite serious, but a, a much lesser threat to most of us. And importantly, uh, as I've noted throughout, this is all occurring based on highly differential risk tiers. And it still does make sense to devise pandemic response policies that respect those risk tiers. But given how far into this we are and how late uh, any relevant policies would be, we really have to take matters into our own hands. So with these very high levels of viral circulation all around the country, if you have risk factors for adverse outcomes if exposed to this virus, and again, that would be any major cardiometabolic condition, so heart disease, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, hypertension, uh, or obesity, or if you are healthy but over age 70, you're in an elevated risk group, you've got to be really careful. You need to be very respectful of the potential this virus has to hurt you. And you need to be able to count on everybody you interact with to respect that risk too. They may not be at high risk. So your, your younger, healthy loved ones may be at much lower risk and they maybe can afford to be relatively cavalier in their behaviors, but only when interacting with other people at low risk. And that means they're likely to be exposed to the virus. They need to stay away from you and you need to stay away from them. So those kinds of precautions have to be practiced within our social networks, our, our family groups. We've got to understand one another's differential risks and we have to respect them. The, the fact that we are well on our way now toward herd immunity and vaccines are coming is, is a very promising combination because vaccines directed to those who have managed to avoid the virus to date plus the very high number who have not, uh, that combination will result in the pandemic coming to an end. I hope, I think, before too long. I, I, like anybody else who, who's tried to predict things about the pandemic, I, I've been humbled, so I'll be cautious. I, I can't assign a date to all of this. Uh, but again, it is actually quite good news that the total case counts are 10 times higher because after all, it's not just that that many more of us have been through this, but the cases that we've missed, the cases that go unreported are obviously mild cases. We don't miss it when someone gets severely ill. We don't miss it when someone gets hospitalized. We certainly don't miss it when someone dies. The cases we miss are mild cases. So that very large proportion of cases that have gone unreported are mild cases, in many instances, asymptomatic cases. It's always been interesting to me that when we've heard about asymptomatic cases of COVID, it's always been reported as some part of the, the doom and gloom scenario. They're asymptomatic people who can transmit the virus. Well, yeah, it's true, but actually a very high percentage of asymptomatic infection means 
most people who get this infection are not hurt by it. And that's good news. And, and by not hurt by it, I don't just mean don't get symptoms initially, don't get hospitalized and don't die. I also mean don't get long-term complications. It looks like most people exposed to this virus breathe through, but not everyone. So uh, there really is good news in the mix even now. Uh, remember, it's always darkest just before the dawn. It, it's, it's unfortunate, of course, that the, um, that the toll around the country is as high as it is. Uh, but it does mean that the population that uh, wasn't exposed before um, is now moving through their surge. And if we are reasonably thoughtful and judicious in our behaviors, there's no reason why it needs to get worse. We keep hearing about the potential for it to get worse than it is now. Uh, it, it really depends on how much of the population thus far has managed to remain away from the virus. That is a diminishing portion of the population over time, uh, but it still may be a, a sizable enough number that the way we behave between now and the end of the pandemic will determine whether or not there is a third wave. But we make the waves. The virus doesn't make the waves. The, the power to prevent that third wave resides with us. So as ever, um, I would respect the virus, respect the risk differentials, uh, but I would look past the doom, the gloom, the drama, and see that uh, the light of a new day is on the horizon. Uh, and, and frankly, that's important too, because uh, the hope that we are getting through this, um, I think is part of what inspires us all to behave in a responsible manner. I and mean, if it looks like it's gonna be doom and gloom for as far ahead as we can see, I think some people just give up. Don't give up. Uh, we can still manage the remainder of this pandemic, prevent additional waves, um, and the tunnel has been long and it has been dark, but there is a light at the end. I can see it, I hope you can too. Stay well.